Thank you so much for kicking us off, Mario. And I invite all of you to visit Mario and his colleagues at the booth, as well as uh, Magnet. You will have Zachary, Catherine, and Tori expecting you there, as well as CCI Learning. You'll have Jessica, Natalie, and Jordan as well. They're very happy to answer any questions you have. Um, so without further ado, our next upcoming presentation is by Dr. Kelvin Bentley, Program Manager at Texas Credentials for Future at the University of Texas System. And just a little bit to give you a, a bit of context, it is an initiative within the University of the Texas System uh, to provide students with access to employer-initiated and validated micro-credential programs at no added cost. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> of course, I, I didn't say, when I say good afternoon, you say good afternoon. It's, it's kind of a weird Texas thing, although I'm actually originally from Detroit, Michigan, so it's actually, it's a pleasure being uh, among uh, so many cool Canadians. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I just say that because I, I've, I've spent some time, you know, when I was younger living in uh, Detroit, you know, going, going to Canada was really cool, right? Like, you know, we had the Ambassador Bridge, we had the tunnel, um, and so it was just great to, to visit Windsor. And, of course, um, over the years I've visited um, other parts uh, like Calgary and Vancouver. Haven't been to Ottawa yet. Um, and, uh, and several other places. So I know I'm um, short on time. Please know that um, I'll have uh, my contact information at the end of the slides today, and uh, hopefully the clicker will work. If you have any questions, just let me know. It, this will go by fairly fast and furious, but my hope is that the, the slides that I have will kind of open up a conversation, and hopefully there will be an opportunity for some of you if you want to join and our approach, I would love uh, collaborators in this work, right? It's, it's not enough to do this in an ISO, you know, in, in, um, in our system. We would love to validate what we're doing um, with other schools, uh, systems, and not just in the United States. And so I think there's just a, a lot that we can learn from each other. So uh, I'm just going to kind of go quickly through some of these. Um, so how do we get started? So. Really, our approach is really trying to uh, give students uh, access to industry-recognized credentials while they are completing their undergraduate degrees. And so our, our working hypothesis is that the combo platter between, you know, of a traditional undergraduate degree that provides access to durable skills plus technical skills that reflect the ever-evolving landscape of the world of work that will hopefully um, help our students uh, stand out uh, from, uh, from those who are not um, you know, pursuing a micro-credential path. And so, um, uh, you know, again, this work started back in 2020. Our Chancellor, J.B. Milliken, who, um, I mean, this was uh, strongly uh, his vision. Um, and, and we spent some time as a system kind of looking at data as well. So we wanted our approach to be uh, also, uh, you know, looking at available data that we have available in Texas. So, for example, and this is a, a public-facing uh, dashboard, so anyone can go to it. Um, we were starting to look at data about our own students, right? So we know about skill gaps. We know, um, uh, tech, you know, technologies like AI are going to displace, uh, you know, certain types of positions in the future. Um, but we started looking at um, data because in Texas we can we have a way of tracking our alumni over time. You know, looking at their median salaries one year, five years, and then ten years after they leave us. And what we were noticing, especially, is that with liberal arts uh, majors, we were finding that they were not doing so well in terms of median salaries compared to their counterparts in other areas like STEM. So. Um, we leveraged this data internally, and we started thinking, well, you know, uh, what are some other data points we need to consider? So looking at just not our alumni in terms of median salaries, we also wanted to look at the research, right? So we, we do know, and there are various studies and articles that support this, career readiness is top of mind uh, for students. And maybe that's also, you know, been an issue more and more because tuition continues to rise, right, out, outpacing the rate of inflation, especially in the United States. So 
Um, we looked at, and, and th this infographic or mini infographic just reflects kind of where students are in terms of their thinking about career readiness, um, that they are interested in, in pursuing for, uh, professional certificates, um, hoping that that will be a better signaler than just the traditional degree in and of itself. Um, a quick aside, I mean, I, I think this, the micro-credentialing work is very interesting in the sense that I think it's really for, for, uh, kind of forcing us to kind of unpack our suitcase, right? So we have a degree, undergraduate, graduate, um, but, you know, we have transcripts too, right, which basically signal grades, but guess what? Employers don't really understand what grades mean. And so there's a real opportunity whether you believe in you know, developing your own micro-credentials locally at your university or embracing, um, embracing the use of industry-recognized credentials like we did, I think there's just an opportunity to really start unpacking and helping students tell a better story about what they know and what they can do. But we can't get there until we really start helping students understand the skills that they are acquiring um, and, and where their skill gaps are as a learner. So, uh, and, and this is just some additional data. This is from MC Burning Glass Institute. Um, and so, it, and Burning Glass now is called Lightcast, but uh, they looked at some of their data as well. And, uh, you know, they're, in, in this particular study, they kind of looked at how, you know, if you, for example, have a sociology degree and you pick up data analytics skills, it can actually increase your uh, overall job uh, potential in terms of a salary. Um, even my undergraduate degree in psychology is also included here as well. Uh, IT management skills can also open up the door for uh, earning potential uh, above and beyond just having the undergraduate degree in and of itself. Uh, so, to help us, and uh, I want to formally just thank uh, the Strata Education Foundation. Back in 2021, um, the University of Texas system, in addition to about 14 other institutions of higher ed, uh, received some initial uh, pilot money to kind of experiment with ways to help students uh, make that transition from the university to the world of work. As you know, there's such an emphasis on completing the degree in and of itself, and this was a great uh, opportunity for us to really kind of widen the aperture of the camera, right? And actually, you know, if we're focused so much on college and students getting a degree and we know college, college degrees have value, what else can we actually do to help students once they leave us? And so um, we received an, an initial grant, uh, which basically then allowed us uh, to come up with a way, leveraging industry-recognized credentials to help our students. And so here in this particular slide, we just talk about um, the outcomes of that initial pilot work, right? So we were able to actually find that um, we were able to embed access to industry-recognized credentials in several programs across eight academic universities within our system. Um, we were able to also have students tell us that they were actually very, uh, you know, they, they were very happy with having access to those credentials. Uh, and again, we were able to offer them for free because um, the access through uh, Coursera, which, was our, which is our partner in uh, providing a, you know, a platform where students can actually complete their degrees, uh, uh, complete their micro-credentials, uh, was made available. So um, we, you know, kind of based on some of our initial findings, we were able to actually qualify um, to get a phase two grant. And so what that really meant for us is that we were able to kind of scale our pilot work with industry recognized credentials. And now we're trying to grow and scale that work um, across more majors. And so I mentioned earlier, we initially target liberal arts majors and really trying to work with those students uh, to embed um, industry recognized credentials, not just in courses, but our approach is also co-curricularly. So what we're also trying to do is provide students a way, even outside of a, a particular course or series of courses, an opportunity to complete a micro-credential from providers like Google, Meta, IBM, and so on. And, uh, and I'll show you a list of uh, some of the micro-credentials that are available through what is called Coursera's Career Academy in a, in a, in a little bit. 
the goals of our current uh, project, and we, we um, pleasantly refer to it, and, and I think this was originally coined by our chancellor, uh, our project is kind of coined, you know, broad, broadly educated, specifically skilled. And so what we're trying to do is really grow access to micro-credentials uh, to many more students. And so our goal between now and the end of our current grant year, which is 2025, is that we're targeting over 30,000 students. We believe gradually over time we can get there because our university system is about a quarter of a million students uh, when you actually add up the nine academic universities and then we also have five uh, health institutions as well which uh, we hope will also have access to this uh, Coursera benefit. And then um, another goal of ours is to really follow the students. And so what I loved hearing today this morning, uh, well, actually now this morning, um, you know, there, were, uh, there was a presenter who kind of talked about, you know, tracking students over time. And, and that's our hope as well. So we, we just don't want to just provide access to the micro-credentials, but we really want to study those outcomes both self-perceived, right? Did it actually bring value to you? Uh, did you maybe get a, a, you know, an interview, in your opinion, based on whether or not you earned this, uh, this micro-credential? But we also wanna look at job outcomes as well, right? So Pallet, Rhonda, you had talked about, it's, it, it's really about the end game. Do students get these types of jobs? And so our hope is to follow up with students to find out when we compare them to, let's say, previous graduates who didn't have the micro-credential, are we finding that uh, students who pursue different micro-credentials, are they, you know, uh, you know, are there certain doors open to them such that they can increase their median salaries? And so we'll be able to look at that over time. Um, so um, in terms of some of the work that we're doing to get us there, because again, even though we're a university system, we're almost like more like a federation of planets for all you Trekkies out there, right? I just say that too because um, Captain Kirk, right, was a, is Canadian, right? So why not mention him here? So, but, um, so what we're trying to do is capacity and infrastructure building, right? So to do this work well, um, especially if we're going to rely on faculty to uh, to, to, to help us with, uh, you know, with growing um, access to micro-credentials. What we uh, initially focused on was finding a way to really kind of educate faculty about what is a micro-credential, right? I mean, there's like tons of ways just to spell it, let alone understanding what they are, right? And so we've developed a four-week um, online course for faculty. We've leveraged some of our grant funds to incentivize them to actually uh, complete the course. And the course is not just about content. Um, there is a, uh, a summative assessment or project where actually faculty can kind of really think about their course and think about very, you know, intentionally how they will actually embed uh, whatever micro-credential they select um, to do. Uh, and some faculty have, you know, are using the course to actually define their own micro-credential that they're gonna offer their students, um, but many are trying to uh, look at the, um, the professional certificates on the Coursera platform to actually embed them in their courses. Some other things too is that we have vendor partners like WorkCred um, and then also the uh, Council for Adult and Experiential Learning. Um, Kale especially has been very helpful because if we talk about this ecosystem, and if you think about it, there's lots of moving pieces. So, if we really allow students to complete a micro-credential, let's say from Google or from other providers, we do want there to be a way for students to get credit for it. Now, one workaround is to just embed it in an existing course, right? So if they're already getting credit, no harm, no foul, they're good. But what if a student comes already with, let's say, a series of micro-credentials from a third party, how will that credit, I mean, will, this, will, the, will your institution award credit? And so we're also doing professional development for faculty and staff across our university to help them think through what that policy might look like, right? Um, and some schools in our system, I think, have a CPL policy, others don't. And so um, we're really hoping that uh, they will weigh the use of micro-credentials uh, locally at their institution. If you're interested in also following along in some of our work, uh, our partner WorkCred um, uh, has this report. And again, you'll have access to the notes. 
But I would take a look at that because um, this report highlights not just our work, but also other uh, university systems like the SUNY system and others. And so, um, and I think you'll find some alignment, um, uh, uh, you know, with maybe many of the things that you're already doing, like the SUNY system, for example. And uh, who, who's again from Seneca? Because I thought the work that Seneca is doing is really impressive, right? 100 micro credentials. Um, the SUNY system as a whole has about 500. So there are many schools um, that are really trying to grow out uh, micro credentials, and that report kind of reflects that. Uh, this is just an easy screenshot of um, some of the, uh, the workshops that Kale is doing for us. So I'll skip through that. But um, and on this slide, you'll just see the variety of um, professional certificates available through the Coursera uh, Career Academy. And so we are leveraging uh, grant funds. Initially, we uh, um, use grant funds to basically allow, again, any student um, or, or some of our students access uh, to these micro-credentials. An interesting thing happened because we actually got our phase two grant earlier last year, but then in July of last year, the Board of Regents and our Chancellor supported an, ex uh, an expanded Coursera contract. So now any faculty member, any, any well, I'm sorry, I should start backwards. Any, um, any uh, student, alum, faculty member, or staff has free access to any of these uh, professional certificates, and this set of, or subset of the Coursera catalog is growing. Um, so every year there will be even newer uh, certificates that will reflect, again, um, skills that are valued in the workforce. And so, um, and then those that are labeled with uh, the words, uh, or the, uh, the acronym ACE, that this stands for the, uh, the American Council on Education, they actually review uh, um, courses and make uh, credit recommendations that universities can consider for transfer. Um, so very interesting. Here are just uh, some examples of uh, some university uh, websites. Uh, so uh, these are four uh, examples of how schools are actually trying to promote to students that Career Academy is available and free to them. Um, and then, um, and then we're also tracking marketing messages, right? So to really do this well, again, you, you can't just say, hey, it's free, good luck, right? Like you, you also have to be looking at your marketing messages. What, you know, how are students interacting with them? What marketing messages actually really can you maybe correlate with um, enrollments on, on the Coursera platform? So we are trying to do our best to track that. Uh, with the hope being that we can share those best practices across universities because, again, as a system, every school has their different uh, marketing campaigns around the Coursera benefit. And, of course, we want to just find the best ways to promote it. Um, uh, someone in the back, I don't know if I can use the clicker to start this video. It's not enough to, to, to hear about our project just for me, but I wanted to maybe just play a short video just to, sh to, to give you a sense of what this benefit has been like at the student level. So um, again, if I click this, I think it'll just go to the next slide, but if someone could maybe just click the rectangle. I know. I'm afraid to click this because I think it's going <laughs> to, and if I, so I think, how am I on time, by the way? Because I do, I do want to leave enough time for questions. Ten minutes, ooh. Oh, yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah, okay, so, tw <laughs> oh, okay, 20 minutes. I don't know, can, yeah, we can't hear it, right? It's a cool video. I can, I can, should I, should I just maybe move on, maybe? Yeah, let's do that. No, that's okay. It's a good video. So again, you, you'll, you'll have access to the link. I'll make sure you have uh, access to the link. So, 
Remember when I said before that um, when we talk about micro-credentials, there's lots of, like when you think of the ecosystem, there are, it's about access to the micro-credentials. We can also define like, okay, who's gonna create it? Are we gonna create it locally? Or are we gonna work with a provider like Coursera or Udacity or edX or whoever? Um, there's also this space, which was also talked about earlier today by another presenter, about like digital badging. And so we have partnered with a company called Territorium to actually do a pilot around the micro-credentials that students are earning. So for the first time in our university's uh, history, we'll have a, a centralized way for students to own the digital badges associated with the micro-credentials that they are completing, whether they come from Coursera or come from, um, from academic courses or come from another provider. So we, we really believe in, um, in learners having access to their own micro-credentials and this digital wallet that will be available will be available forever, right? So we're not charging students for it, um, but we do want to provide this as a way for students to have access to their credentials. And there is, um, and, and I hate to throw out AI because again, AI is evolving in terms of what our knowledge of what AI can do for us. But the wallet also has a way to kind of give students feedback on the skills that they are reporting as a function of the micro-credentials that they're earning. So students can kind of see, oh, you know, I have these, uh, the, this set of skills, but maybe if I'm interested in this career path, these other skills are some things I may want to shoot for. Um, and there's also a way to also, um, you know, um, also apply for uh, particular jobs that align with the skills you have or the skills you want to have. And so there's, there's uh, our hope is that the digital wallet will be a good resource to our, to our students. Um, okay, so some things that we're really interested in. We're really interested in really asking the question again for our learners, do micro-credentials, do they have perceived value to you? Uh, and then with our alums, we also want to ask that question again, but, but then also look at employment outcomes, um, which again, um, uh, the speaker today from, um, from Daya, Dias, Daya? Uh, Dias, thank you, um, talked about it's, it's not easy to get, uh, to follow um, folks over time to find out, okay, you know, to, to ask them about their micro-credential journey, right? It's, it, it gets a little bit tricky, but we're gonna, we're gonna explore that. But we, we do want to find out um, from, our, from our alumni, you know, to what value did the micro-credential have? Uh, again, perceived value versus actual value. And then we also are going to track uh, the perceptions of our students around their use of the digital wallet and then the comprehensive learner record. And so our hope too is that we'll have a proof of concept of a comprehensive learner record, not to replace the traditional transcript, but our hope is that we can empower our students to tell a better story about what they know and what they can do. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a process, uh, so it's, it's not something that can happen just like this, but our hope is that by piloting these, uh, by our Territorium pilot, our hope is that we can do that um, and get some data. So some other things, current data gathering activities. And so as you can imagine, there's lots of opportunities for us to collect data um, the interesting thing about Coursera is that we have now nine academic universities, but guess what? There is no system level Coursera account. And so we're working with Coursera on a monthly basis to basically give us all the enrollment data, um, all the micro-credential completion data that we can then use within a Power BI dashboard. Um, we're also working with our project leads as well to help us uh, track um, academic skill badging because guess what? Right, tons of uh, faculty, well not tons, but there are faculty who want to do their own uh, micro-credentials, but there's not really a way right now for us to know that you have embedded a micro-credential in your course in this current semester. A lot of it is, is like, you know, it's survey data. So we're trying to work locally with our project leads to ask their faculty colleagues, uh, so have you developed a micro-credential and what, how many students were impacted and so on, what skills, does that micro-credential represent? A lot of organic work, but it's important for us to track that as well as our Coursera data. And then we're gonna collaborate, uh, we collaborate with our campus IR directors to give us demographic data. So the next slides I'm gonna go through super fast, but you'll have a copy of this. Here's the Power BI dashboard that I referenced. So across nine academic universities, 
we have kind of a, a landing page where we'll be able to track over time enrollments, how many micro-credentials completed, how many students uh, impacted. And again, we have a long way to go, but at least now we'll have a way to track this data uh, and then also follow up locally with our campuses to kind of find out from them what's working, what's, what's not working so well. Uh, because again, marketing, even though we've made the micro-credentials available for free, right, um, as we know, students are busy, life gets in the way, and so we need to continue to find uh, ways uh, for students to find the uh, micro-credentials uh, a worthwhile investment. And a part of it is hearing stories like the one I wanted to try to show you in that video, right? Students telling students about the benefits, I think, will be uh, one of our better ways of getting students motivated to enroll and hopefully complete. Um, we're also leveraging our data warehouse as well. And so one thing um, at the system level, we're working with our uh, institutional research officers to give us what Coursera can't give us, right? Because if you think about it, Coursera data is very limited in terms of demographics, right? Um, how, many, how many of your institutions maybe use like a, either Coursera or a Coursera-like platform? Okay, maybe, okay, nobody, that's okay. Um, I do not work for Coursera, it's not a big deal. But, but the thing is, um, Coursera is a very, like Coursera and your student information system are, are very separate, they never touch. And so what we're working with is like once a student creates their own account in Coursera, we're trying to then uh, validate that they are the student at whatever institution that they've identified and then pull in the demographic data. So we have a sense now, we, we'll have a way to kind of find out, okay, how many, how many uh, men or women are gravitating toward a particular uh, uh, industry recognized credential pathway? Um, Maybe there'll be opportunities to leverage those insights to better market to subgroups, right? So African-American men, African-American women, and so on. Uh, maybe we can do a better job of uh, informing these subgroups that this benefit is available and could be helpful to them in their career exploration. Uh, and, and so we have a way to kind of click in and actually, again, just study at a very high level um, the, uh, the demographic information, which is then uh, illustrated here. And we can do it by campus or, or subset of campuses as well. And so we're, we're doing our best to try to, like if we're gonna do this type of investment, we really need to study it closely. And uh, leveraging the Power BI dashboard data um, will be uh, very helpful for us. Um, and, uh, okay, so what are some other things we're gonna do? We got. We got lots of surveys, uh, so student satisfaction survey, alumni satisfaction survey. Um, there's actually an opportunity and it's not really required of our grant, but I think we need to ask our faculty and staff, um, you know, uh, their satisfaction because remember, uh, this benefit has been expanded now to include them, right? So, which I, I think that's a, that's a kind of a cool thing. And some faculty are already, uh, they're receiving incentives to actually complete let's say a Google cert in data analytics before they actually uh, teach the course with that embedded inside of it. So it gives faculty a chance to really look under the hood, uh, right, and actually better understand the learning objectives of their course versus the learning objectives of, um, of, uh, of the uh, micro-credential and then kind of decide how they're gonna actually embed it and use it uh, in their courses. And then another thing that we're gonna do how am I good? Am I good on time still? Five minutes? Two minutes? I'm sorry. Thirteen minutes. Okay, that's total. Yes. Okay. So we're 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 finally making the home stretch. Stepping Stepping Blocks Alumni Link is one of the tools that we're going to use longitudinally. So one of the things that you can do with this type of a tool is that a priori you can actually say, here are all my let's say in, in our case we have a running list of who's enrolled in Coursera, right? We have a way to also track demographic data, but that's separate. The question that we'll use stepping blocks to help us answer is, okay, over time, what types of, uh, what types of let's say, uh, job titles do they have? What type of um, um, 
you know, who are they working with and, you know, um, and, and so on. What, how much experience are they gaining after they leave us? And so uh, if you go to steppingblocks.com, I believe that's the URL, um, you'll, 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 you'll see uh, more, of, uh, more information about the platform. But as a system, outside of our grant funding, our system allowed us to purchase um, access to stepping blocks, which really allows you, uh, it, it basically leverages publicly available uh, information, uh, like on a LinkedIn profile or a GitHub account. Uh, it also pulls in employer information about various roles. And so there are about 125 million profiles um, that uh, this data is, uh, um, is uh, kind of holding on to and providing access to for schools who want to use it. But it's a way for you to really kind of track who your alumni are, where do they live, the types of jobs that they have. Um, they use the mean instead of the median salaries, but they use mean salaries as well. And so we'll be able to actually securely provide a list of who our learners are to Stepping Blocks, and they will also then give us information that we can use to kind of validate the types of jobs and estimates around their salaries over time. And so for, for, for me anyway, being newer in this space, I haven't really heard of a lot of schools leveraging Stepping Blocks in this way, but I think we, but our approach is that we need to do this type of analysis, right? Because again, we want to better understand students. And even if you don't have stepping blocks, if you think about it, why not survey your alums? Like if you have a way to track uh, the students who are in, let's say your academic, uh, I mean in your courses who, where there's a, a micro-credential that your instructor created, or a micro-credential that was provided by a platform like Coursera, you could survey them, right? Uh, and save um, some of the money that we saved in terms of spending it on stepping blocks, which is fine. But that type of longitudinal view is needed now more than ever, if we're ever gonna to get to the point of understanding the value of the micro-credentials that we're spending so much time either developing in-house, right? As well as the money that we're investing to partner with a Coursera or a Udacity to pr to provide it for for our students. So, um, some other things I've included in this deck, which you'll have access to, uh, the um, the um, the Harvard's uh, the project on the workforce also released a really cool um, article. But I I've I've, I've curated some uh, micro credential articles and resources some of which you might be familiar with, others might be new to you. So please check out that URL. Um, and, and also recommend to me articles and things based on the work that you're doing here in Canada that I, would, that I should be including. Because one of the reasons why I wanted to come here today, and thank you eCampus Ontario uh, for inviting me, uh, I wanted just to learn from all of you as well. Okay, so, um, so check, that, check that out. Uh, and then also, hey, I welcome, right? I want you to be a part of our community as well. So we have webinars and things like that, uh, a Slack channel, um, all the things that you're probably already doing, but if you wanna also like kind of follow along and find us, uh, you know, follow us and learn what we're up to, please uh, do so. Um, and again, I provided the tiny URL because again, maybe you don't have your cell phone handy or maybe you got a flip phone. How many people still have a flip phone? <laughs> I know flip phones still have cameras, right? All right. I used to have like a Razer flip phone. Sometimes I miss it. All right, so here's my contact information. I'm sorry I rushed through like the last few slides, but again, you know, we, we can spend hours and hours talking about certain elements of this, but please reach out anytime. You can email me. You can also uh, book time. Not everyone gives their calendar link. Uh, but but I, I find sometimes just having one-on-one -on -one, uh, conversations, even if it's for 15 minutes, uh, can be helpful. And with that, let me be helpful for you. What questions can I initially uh, address? And uh, thank you for your time, by the way. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, I was informed that we can go to, to your video with audio if you want to do that before the questions, or we're good to go to the questions. Oh, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm open with anyone just... Okay, um, please raise your hand, whoever has questions for Kelvin. 
I, I will say it again because I because when I do this presentation, I worry that someone will say, which is which is you know a, a good critique. It's like, oh, you're from the University of Texas. First of all, we're we're you know we represent whatever institution from Canada, right? Or oh, you got a grant, or oh, you also got um, University of Texas University monies to expand what you're doing. I will challenge you and say, yes, that's all that is correct. But I would really encourage you to think about how, if again, if we're doing micro-credentialing work, regardless of how much money we have, it's really about the long game, right? So to what extent can you leverage resources to not just create the micro-credentials or partner with someone to offer them for you? To what extent are you willing to invest in, of course, the infrastructure, right? You know, faculty development, uh, staff development around this, but then also, how are you going to follow up the learners, right? Surveying them, follow up interviews, and then also something I didn't talk about today, which is the employer piece. Talking with employers to, to really find out are the micro-credentials you're offering or making available through a third party, are they, what weight do they have? What value do they have to them? And so, and that, these are things you can do without millions and millions of dollars. You can do that today, but to be honest with you, I don't know of a lot of schools who do that, right? It's all about, hey, here's a micro-credential. Take it. <laughs> it's almost like a drug deal. It's like, take this micro-credential. <laughs> when really we need to think about more than just, okay, taking it, we, we want the students to help us understand the value. Yes? Uh, yes. Uh, oh, so yeah, sorry. Uh, so you said that you, in, cer in uh, certain micro-credential, you uh, ask the, the students to, um, to do some uh, meta or Google credentials, I mean yeah. exams. So can you elaborate to, around that? So does it actually gives value to, uh, to the courses and how the employers uh, receive that? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. So really, I mean, because I know we're short on time, we have faculty at each of our academic universities who are really just trying to figure out, okay, if I teach X, could, let's say, uh, for example, we have a faculty member who teaches uh, a digital marketing course, and what she found uh, is that by offering her students access to the digital, I mean, to the data analytics certificate offered by Google, that the content aligned with content she was already offering but now students have the bonus of earning the micro-credential in her course. And the way that she did it is basically making it an optional activity, right? So you could do it if you want to, but it wasn't forced on the students as well, because maybe some of you have that question, like, is it optional, is it required? If you don't want to do it, that's okay. But I think, you know, for, for this particular faculty member, she really wanted students just to have the opportunity to do it. Another school, University of Texas Arlington, has a really cool program called Power Up Tech Up, where any student can actually complete a Google search in anything, but co-curricularly. So now it doesn't need to live in a course, because if you think about it, maybe not a, you know, maybe there are faculty who are like, ugh, this wasn't created by me, I don't trust it, I'm not gonna teach it. That's fine, but then maybe more of our schools can then offer that co-curricular option, so that regardless, of the local choice of a faculty member, students should still have the option, right? And so many of our schools are trying to define what that co-curricular pathway looks like. And then also think about something that was brought up earlier today, wraparound services, right? Making it available for free in and of itself is not enough. You have to curate some support, and UT Arlington uh, has done that uh, through that particular program, because it's, it's more cohort-based, and it's more, um, more about like student coaching, success coaches reaching out to students going, hey, hey girl, you took, you're in our, right, you're in our uh, Google cert uh, in data analytics, how you doing, right? Uh, I see you've only completed two out of the eight courses, right? You can do it, right? But, but you need that, right? Because otherwise you're just left to your own devices and then you may not complete it. Now the flip side of that is some students may not complete the entire thing, but guess what? They might still find value in that, and that's why we're gonna survey our students to ask the question, right? Because again, it's all, it, we've been so much about completion, but maybe it's about 
even partial completion could potentially be successful, I mean helpful, and then if students are still getting a digital badge per class, they could still show off those digital badges for the, let's say, the first two courses that they completed, even before they complete the entire thing, if that makes sense. So, yeah, yeah. Hello. Oh. Okay, it's working. Yeah, yeah, it's um, good. I really enjoyed your presentation. My name is Christina, and I'm here with a learning experience design company yeah. called The Learning Experts. And um, I, I was just noticing how you were talking about uh, the relationship between micro-credentials and alumni. And, yeah. you know, I follow a lot of conversations around micro-credentials here in Ontario and in Canada. And I, I haven't encountered yet, maybe it's happening, but I haven't encountered yet a a, a, a big conversation or interest around um, the alumni population as um, as a learner for micro credentials and how that might further or advance the work of advancement. So, you know, if a, if yeah. um, a university can market itself as a learning partner to undergraduates um, right. over their career lifespan, what does that mean in terms of the student's perception of their connection to their institution and their capacity to right. give later? So I just was wondering whether you had any data around that or if if that's a, that's a big conversation in the States around micro-credentials, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a great question in the sense that I think maybe schools are thinking about it. I haven't seen any data that kind of links giving with you know providing that initial access. Um, unfortunately, we have a campus, and I can't mention it by name because they'll beat me up. Um, they actually have turned off the alumni benefit locally because they feel that it's in competition with um, continuing ed courses that they're already offering. But I, I, I truly, I, I mean, I, I think there's something there in terms of what you said by, you know, because again, students are giving us so much of their time and money, why can't we give them a benefit? Which then will say, and then students, uh, alumni will be like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe I should give back because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing value beyond just the four years I was there, right? They can help me with my ongoing uh, skilling and reskilling needs, so, yeah. All right. Again, please, if you have any other questions, one uh, more. again, um, let, oh, I'm one sorry. More. Yeah. Sorry, Don. Yeah. I know you yeah. got your hand up real straight. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> but so did I. Uh, yeah. So thank, I, I just want to thank you so much for oh, thank you. Um, the, the talk, um, but specifically for opening the conversation wider when it comes to outcomes. Right. I think what you proposed about the idea of yeah. perception of is so critical and is, is I think yeah. something that a lot of us got into this work uh, from the beginning yeah. um, being really interested in uh, because yes it's about getting yeah. hired yes it's about making more money but we all know that these things are not so cut and dry right there's a lot of gray area you might go in for a job someone out there's a better candidate there it doesn't right. mean that nothing has been gained, right? right. So I, I'd love if you could just explain for us a little bit more how that perception piece shows up in the research questions that you're asking, just so that you can inspire um, all the people in this room to do the same and integrate those kinds of questions into their research projects. Yeah, and, and, and I'm open to collaborating. I mean, we're, we're still kind of fleshing out the types of questions we're gonna ask. Our hope, though, is that we will, again, just ask for, um, kind of, you know, ask our learners, you know, what, you know, again, what is the overall perceived value? But we, we, we're still trying to figure out, okay, what, you know, without making the survey 100 questions long, you know, what, what about the micro-credential? I mean, did you, did it empower you? Like, did it, did it help you feel, um, like, uh, like, in terms of your self-efficacy, right? Uh, I mean, which could actually be a, a separate way you could do it. You could take questions from a self-efficacy scale and add that to your survey, or you could just ask them, did, did you feel like um, you were motivated to kind of continue on in your course or in your program? Um, did you, uh, you know, did you, I mean, th there's different ways to do it, but, it, but we will, because the longitudinal stuff will take a little bit more time, so using the stepping blocks tool to really look at like, um, you know, salary outcomes and things like that, 
will take time, but there are some things we can ask them now, like again, what overall value, maybe even asking students to describe what that value is, right? So there's a qualitative, and again, I'm not a, I'm not a, a big researcher, so, um, but qualitative analysis is something that we probably could actually look at as well, just looking at the narratives, the sentences that students provide about their overall experience. Because I think there's something to be gained from that, from that too. Yeah. Hey, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah. sorry, we went over. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bentley, for that wonderful yeah, and enriching uh, you know presentation anytime. as well as the discussion. And I invite anyone who has any other questions to join us for a networking social um, to have an occasion to ask more questions and, and talk to your fellow colleagues. So we have a, f a few minutes break, and what I would like to invite you to do is to head over to the photo booth for those who've been here at TESS. The infamous photo booth is back. So you are in good luck. It is just that way, so as you exit, it's on the right-hand side. And I further challenge you to post those photos on LinkedIn with the hashtag microcred 2024. And one last thing before I let you all go, uh, we have a 15, well, actually it's cut short, so 10 minute break. And our next sessions begin at 2.15. It's three concurrent sessions, so you're welcome to either stay here in event hall, Nahani, or Yoho. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>